to get going and uh, welcome to the webinar existing and novel approaches to vaccine science. Um, thank you for joining and taking the time to be with us today. My name is Ruth Ackerman and I'll be the moderator for this evening. I'm the director of professional development at the Ontario Pharmacists Association. I want to thank uh, Sakaris for their generous sponsorship of tonight's program, as well as a bunch of other professional development programs that we will be um, doing at OPA. On today's agenda, I'll first provide a little overview about OPA and its advocacy efforts around vaccinations. And then I will introduce today's speaker who will be guiding you through the presentation. We'd love to hear from you, so put your questions in the Q&A, and at the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. So for those of you who may be new to OPA, we are Canada's largest advocacy organization and professional development provider for pharmacy professionals across Ontario. With over 10,000 members, OPA is committed to enhancing the pharmacy profession and excellence in patient care. The pharmacy profession has played and continues to play a critical role in the vaccine rollout and battle against COVID-19. As of August the 9th, 2021, over 3.3 million COVID vaccine doses have been administered through Ontario pharmacies. This is a significant feat and demonstrates the integral role of pharmacy professionals in, the, in Ontario's healthcare system. From March 10th, 2021, when the vaccine rollout in pharmacies began, there have been various trials and triumphs, and that journey continues as pharmacy professionals work to safely get shots in the arms and move Ontario back to normalcy. OPA has advocated for pharmacy to be leveraged in the footprint of the vaccination campaign. One of the major milestones was to have 2,500 pharmacies onboarded onto the program, and to date there have been 2,530 pharmacy locations participating. As with any change in scope of practice, OPA has developed tools and resources for pharmacy professionals and have apprised members of news and updates. Without the support of our members, OPA would not be able to continuously advance the pharmacy profession. Our members make what we do possible. Thank you for all the pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, assistants, interns, and students who are working on the front lines and have stepped up to protect our communities. And now we are starting to turn our attention to flu vaccines. Since 2012, when pharmacists began providing flu shots, we have seen community pharmacy as the preferred point for Ontarians to get their flu shots for themselves and their families. Over 1.8 million doses of vaccine were injected by pharmacists during the 2020-2021 season. But it's not a perfect system and OPA is there to advocate on your behalf. To that end, OPA has presented a plan to the government that will make flu shots even more efficient and accessible for all Ontarians. Our four main asks include Please reduce the administrative burden and barriers to participation associated with the program. Provide greater flexibility in the allocation of supply to, the, to better support evolving patient demand patterns. Allow trained registered pharmacy technicians to administer flu shots and provide fair reimbursement. We are hoping that this government can support our suggestions. So now to our speaker, Dr. Mark Loeb is a, I'll just stop share so he can take things away. Dr. Mark Loeb is a professor at the Departments of Pathology of Molecular Medicine and Health Research Evidence and Impact at the McMaster University where he holds the Michael DeGroote Chair in Infectious Diseases. He is co-director of the McMaster Who World Health Organization Collaborating Center on Infectious Diseases, Research Methods, and Recommendations. Dr. Loeb was Division Director for Infectious Diseases at McMaster University from 2010 to 2020. Dr. Loeb completed his undergraduate degree in medical school at McGill University. He completed internal medicine at the University of Toronto and a fellowship in infectious diseases and medical microbiology at McMaster University, along with an MSc in clinical epidemiology and biostatistics. He has served on over 60 advisory data safety 
and monitoring, management, guideline, and external review committees, including CIHR, NIH, the World Health Organization, and the Center for Disease Control. He has been conducting cluster randomized control trials of influenza vaccine in children to examine herd immunization in the past herd immunity in the past 15 years and has received funding as a principal investigator from NIH, CIHR, MRC UK, and WHO for research on influenza vaccines. He is currently conducting a global randomized trial of influenza vaccination to reduce adverse vascular events in patients with heart failure, including over 5,000 participants. Recognitions have included gold medal in medicine from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada for research, society, and healthcare epidemiology of, of America investigator award, and the Jonas Salk Award from the March of Dimes for research contributions and fellowship, and fellowship in the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Wow. <laughs> Take it away, Dr. Lowe. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ruth. So, and thank you for the, uh, for the kind invitation. So what I'm gonna be um, talking about is real world evidence and uh, influenza vaccination. And um, what I'm gonna go over is, is really, you know, how we frame real world evidence, how we use it um, with respect to influenza vaccination. You know, when, what are the strengths, what are the limitations and, you know, how, do we, how does it compare to randomized controlled trials? Um, so the specific objectives will include, first of all, uh, what do we mean by real world evidence? And uh, I'll go over the type of real world evidence that's available for influenza vaccine vaccines, um, and then talk about how real world evidence can be applied to novel approaches uh, in vaccine science, including cell-based vaccine production, um, mRNA vaccines, and we'll talk about, uh, you know, COVID as well, viral vector, and uh, as well as protein-based immunization. But the, the real um, theme, I think, I, you know, I, I, I want to convey is the, the framing, the place of, of, uh, of real-world evidence. So when we talk about real world evidence, it's built on real world data. And this is uh, an FDA definition of real world data. And that's data regarding the usage or the potential benefits or risks of a drug that's derived from sources other than traditional clinical trials. So it's outside of what we typically think of as research. And uh, real world data are, are data that relate to patient health status and the delivery of healthcare. That's again, it's routinely collected from a variety of sources. So ultimately it's, a, it's an extremely pragmatic type of, uh, type of research. And these are examples of, of real world data. So clinical real world data includes electronic health records, lab test results, diagnosis, anything in an in a electronic um, health record, discharge diagnosis, uh, admissions, you know, things that are collected really in the real world, not as part of, of any trial. Uh, it could also include medications, their orders, their administration, their routes, uh, their sales, their prescriptions, um, claims data, for example, um, medical claims, uh, a lot of large uh, real world evidence comes from these types of claims. And you can also think of real world data as molecular profiling, for example, if it's done in the course of routine public health, uh, family histories that are collected in large databases to the extent that they are. Um, mobile health records, for example, that's another thing. Uh, environmental factors, again, uh, monitoring of the environment, uh, again, not necessarily part of, of research, um, and patient reported outcomes for, for example, uh, adverse events. Um, social media can also be considered part of uh, real world data and, you know, and the literature as well. What's, what's, uh, what can be derived from, uh, from uh, various forms of, of literature. So real world evidence uh, in contrast to data is the clinical evidence about the usage and the potentials of 
potential benefits or risks of a medical product derived from the, anal the analysis of real world data. So essentially it's you know, taking the, those data, that data element and doing some sort of, generally speaking, it's a comparative analysis and that's how we define real world evidence. Uh, and for the most part, when we when we talk about uh, real world evidence, it's it's based, as I mentioned, uh, on data that's not you know not research data. It was never intended for research use, so it's not it's it's observational data. That's that's usually the case. It's by definition observational, but you can have observational data that's from research, or you can have observational data just from real life. Uh, transactional data. So 90% of the real world evidence is based on this sort of tra transactional data, the things that I was mentioning, electronic health records, claims data, et cetera. Now there's a certain component of these observational, from uh, observational data that's used uh, and that's still considered real world data to generate real world evidence. And that data was primarily collected for research. And it could have been like a large cohort study, uh, for example, you know, specifically for a purpose like the Framingham, if it's a cardiovascular types of question that's being asked, or it could have been intended for some other person, uh, a purpose like the nurse's health study. So very, very large cohorts and very, very large registries. So there's a variety of source, but um, they're all, you know, what they share is they're non-experimental, that is, uh, they're non-randomized uh, sources of data. So what differences exist between, you know, randomized and so-called sort of uh, database studies? Well, randomization includes you know randomization at baseline so there's uh, often controlled measurements so the uh, outcomes are pre-specified um, there's randomization so both variables that are uh, that, that are potentially confounded known and unknown are accounted for and there's a you know there's a sort of a parsimonious simplicity uh, of design and and a priori you could be confident in causal or conclusions because it's randomized. Uh, database studies, of course, there's no randomization. Uh, often the observations, the outcomes aren't standardized. It's not like you're setting a study, right? When you're doing an experiment, which is a randomized controlled trial, it's a form of experiment. You're, you're essentially, um, you know, you're, you're setting everything from, from the get-go. So you can actually ask exactly what those outcomes are. You know, you make up the standard uh, definitions and you go forward that way with a database study, you know, you don't have that luxury. So sometimes you have to piece together a, uh, an outcome based on what's available. So it could be, you know, relatively uh, complex. The, the, the strength of it though, is that you can have a particular target population that might not have been randomized for a number of reasons in the, in the trial. So you can have some confidence that the data is applying to, you know, the population and the types of patients that you are interested in. This is an example just comparing, you know, electronic uh, health records to claims data. So if you focus on the on the bottom there, you could see that there's often a rich source of clinical data from electronic uh, health records. So there's there's basic demographic uh, diagnosis, there could be comorbidities, health history, disease severity, uh, depending on what, you know, the, obviously depending on what what's entered, but a lot of, a lot of variables that, that could be very uh, informative. Um, prescriptions as well, or in this case, we're talking about vaccines and hospital admissions and discharge. And you can see that the claims data is almost, it's, it's got some of the, the, those key element, elements, but it doesn't have that degree of description. So there could be basic demographic information, dates of physician visits, codes for what they were for, uh, prescription, or let's say if we're talking about vaccines, what type of vaccine was given when, and hospital discharge. So they both have their, um, 
you know, the, the strength, obviously, the electronic health record often can have a lot of, of data, but with claims data, you could sometimes use fewer variables, so it could make it more feasible to um, do analysis, uh, you know, comparative analysis on, on extremely large sources of data that you might not be able to do with, with electronic uh, health records. And uh, when you look at randomized controlled trials and you compare it to real world evidence, there's clearly there are beneficial effects from, from both, from randomized controlled trials. There could be an intended effect, what you're, you know, uh, what you are looking at in your primary outcome. Uh, sometimes it'd be an unintended effect that might be beneficial on, on outcomes that, uh, you know, that, that weren't necessarily uh, stated a priori. Um, the strength, and, and this happens to a lesser extent with real world evidence. Uh, the real strength with real world evidence though comes with respect to harm that mainly uh, the point is, is that randomized controlled trials are often not powered to look at rare events that are harmful, whereas real world evidence can capture that. So that's really a, a, an important principle. And an example is the, you know, VAERS uh, CDC uh, surveillance for myocarditis. So these are, you know, self-reports uh, of uh, this, for this example, it's the myocarditis or pericarditis reports uh, following mRNA COVID vaccination based on after 300 million mRNA doses. So if you have a trial of, you know, 20 or 30,000, it could be a very great, nicely well-designed RCT, but the event rates uh, can be so rare that you're not gonna be able to pick those up in the RCT. And you need these sort of real world data to produce real world evidence to, um, to pick up side effects that still, you know, are, might or might not be associated um, and then you, you know, they, it's a, sort of a, a starting point where you generate hypotheses about where, whether the uh, effect, you know, to what extent are those events higher than what would be expected if someone hadn't received a vaccine. So real world data can also help improve the efficiency of randomized control trials, even if it's not used to generate real world evidence. So for example, from this data, you can generate hypotheses for testing in randomized controlled trial, even if you don't, you know, if you use the data and you don't, don't decide to do a, some sort of comparative analysis and change the real world data into evidence. Uh, the real world data can help identify drug development tools. You could, again, generate hypothesis about what biomarkers you want to use, for example, to assess risk, for example. Uh, it could ass help assess trial feasibility uh, by examining the effect of your planned eligibility criteria in a, in, a, in a population. So you could look at the real world data and say, well, how many of these individuals have the particular comorbidity that would increase my, in increase my event rate uh, which is what you might want in a randomized controlled trial. So it can help you select the right population and it could help identify certain prognostic indicators or uh, patient characteristics, again, that, that for enrichment of the stratification. So in the past, as I mentioned, the, the real world evidence often has been used to monitor and evaluate for safety, you know, for example, the FDA, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, uh, they, they perform a very large scale safety uh, monitoring studies. And you know, we do the same thing in Canada. Um, but you know, whenever, whatever design you use, whether it's an RCT or real world data, there's always you know, strengths and limitations. So there's certain limitations to real world evidence that you know, we call threats to, to validity. And, one is reverse causation. That, that happens when the outcome status influences the therapy. So it's a, almost a directionality problem where you're you know, doing some sort of comparative analysis, but it creates a real bias if the outcome um, changes what the treatment 
influences the treat the, the therapy. So um, that's an important thread, which you know it's not really an issue in a randomized controlled trial because uh, as an experiment, you set the, what the intervention is and then you follow up with the outcome. So there's, it's very, very clear. Um, adjusting for mediating variables is another, you know, for example, certain drugs have certain duration so that, you know, if you're doing a, um, you know, a drug trial or an antibiotic trial and you're selecting a, an antibiotic that's given for a requisite number of days, you don't want to be adjusting uh, for that duration necessarily. Um, and there's also uh, threats, uh, another threat, an interesting one is called depletion of, uh, of susceptibles. And, and that is exactly what it is, is for example, if you're doing a, a vaccine study, and I'll give you an example in a, in a second where people are getting infected earlier on and they're not vaccinated, it, it interferes, it creates actually a bias in vaccine efficacy. And the other one is immortal time bias. And, and uh, that's, you know, that's sort of a classic example where whether the outcome is death or another, you know, another outcome, it's sort of being, it, it's not being accounted for and it's creating a, a bias. So an example of depletion of susceptibles is if you're doing a flu randomized controlled trial and you're enrolling in uh, participants from, not so not a random, yeah, it could be a randomized controlled trial, and you're uh, um, enrolling individuals from August to no November. I mean, it's a randomized control trial, but it's just as easy to do or even, even more likely with an observational study. And you enroll them and they, you know, they're about to get vaccinated and you start, uh, and this happens a lot in um, more so I'd say in observational studies or in real world data studies, where you're continuously trying to look at to see how vaccine efficacy has changed. Um, the problem is, is that your individuals who were not vaccinated, who were initially susceptible, they get all infected and then they become immune. So it creates a, a sort of a distortion so that if there's, if the vaccine efficacy, uh, you know, really waned or whether it didn't wane, it, it basically creates an effect to the null so that you're overestimating the vaccine efficacy, not because of any inherent effect of the vaccine, but just because the, the susceptibles were, you know, were, who were not vaccinated all got infected so that the, the proportions of susceptibles were, were different between the two groups. Uh, immortal time bias, the, you know, the classic example is, uh, it, it's, it's sort of a, an issue of when the clock starts. So if you have a, a study where at discharge, let's say um, the clock starts, so you start looking for events um, right at discharge from hospital, but let's say there's a week period or two weeks uh, when they actually get the treatment, there's this excluded immortal time where they might actually have the outcome and it's not even being counted. So what it does, it creates a bias towards the, uh, the treatment. The treatment ends up looking better than it really is. So these are all, uh, you know, these are all threats to validity that, that, that are more likely actually in non-randomized than in randomized studies. But as I, but I, as I showed you, the, that example of a uh, vaccine, it's, it's uh, fair even to say that it, occur, it can occur in vaccine trials. Um, again, there have been, uh, you know, attempts to, to say, well, if we're going to use real world data to generate real world evidence, let's try to mimic an RCT. So this is one sort of figure that says, okay, well, if you have a, I call it a covariate assessment period, and that you have a washout from previous exposures, and then you start the cohort at a certain date, an inception date, and you start, um, you know, you start monitoring for events at that time, you're gonna, you know, you're, you're going to reduce the possibility for things like uh, immortal time bias. So of course, this is the um, uh, a schema of uh, randomized controlled trials where participants get randomized to the vaccine or no vaccine. And the traditional RCT is not what uh, we're talking about when we're talking about real world evidence. So just to help differentiate the two, 
In a traditional randomized controlled trial, often the studies are randomized, blinded. They're, they're quite restri restrictive eligibility criteria. So the external generalizability will be limited to those participants who uh, receive the, the vaccine. Um, they're, they're designed also for um, to have participant characteristics that enhance responsive responsiveness to the intervention. So, you know, although, you know, you talk about there has to be equipoise and all that when you're doing a randomized controlled trial, which is true, but um, you're not doing a randomized controlled trial because you have no idea what's going to work. You, you know, you're doing it to test a hypothesis because you have a hunch that your vaccine is going to work. So, uh, so you, uh, you, you know, your, your design is meant to have to include participants that will have high event rates. So they'll have a lot of flu, a lot of COVID so that you, you know, you'll be able to power the study to be able to look at differences. So, and the RCT uses separate resources to collect data, of course, uh, case record forms. So, you know, this is not what real world evidence does. You're, you're basically generating the, the data collection. It's all done separately only for the purpose of the research. And of course, there are strict protocols in a randomized controlled trial. If, if, you know, if the participant or something happens that does not you know, follow the, uh, the protocol, it's a protocol deviation. All of that gets tracked very, very, or should get tracked very, very carefully. So a key point uh, is that um, having said all that, Real world evidence might be strictly observational evidence where participants are not randomized. However, it's fair to say that there are hybrid or pragmatic randomized controlled trials that would be considered by uh, real world evidence by FDA or other uh, regulatory bodies. So you can, you, can, you can generate real world evidence in some sort of capacity with a randomized controlled trial. Obviously, it depends on. On, on, on the trial or what it looks like. So just to, to give some, uh, pardon the pun, real world examples, uh, this is a, a uh, figure from Tom Reichardt. Tom Reichardt is a, a, a physician who started life as a, uh, as a scientist. Uh, he was actually doing, I think, biophysics and, and eventually um, became, you know, quite wealthy in terms of businesses and, and then decided at one point to sort of dedicate himself just to answering the question of why people uh, die at greater rates in the, in the winter. So this led him to uh, a number of very influential studies uh, about mortality, winter and influenza. This figure summarizes his, uh, his observations that uh, things like ischemic and cardiovascular, cerebrovascular disease, pneumonia and influenza all peak in, uh, in the winter, yet uh, incidence of cancer, or cancer, for example, doesn't. So it just led him to along that uh, route of association between winter death and flu. And in fact, there have been a number of observational studies which have uh, shown an association, a pretty strong association between influenza and cardiovascular adverse vascular events. And this is a an example of a study done by Jeff Wong from Toronto, where the analysis is anchored by when the flu is detected. And then there's a risk period, the seven day risk period after that, uh, where he measured whether, you know, what the incidence of acute myocardial infarction is. And then there's the, the darker green is the control interval to see, um, you know, if there are any myocardial uh, infarctions in those periods. So you can see that it's just basically a comparison of inc incidence of myocardial infarction right after someone who has the flu or in a, at a completely different time. And Jeff found that there was a six-fold um, incidence of, of acute myocardial infarction uh, right after the flu compared to that control period showing, suggesting a, a strong association. And there have been a number of uh, meta-analysis of relatively small randomized controlled trials uh, that have shown a, an, an effect of flu vaccine suggesting but maybe a, about a 40% uh, risk reduction with the, with the flu, but not, not you know, a really large study or anything like that. 
So we are doing, and I'm showing this as a, I guess it's somewhat pragmatic, but it's not necessarily real world evidence. We're doing a randomized controlled trial of, of flu vaccine, inactivated influenza vaccine, to reduce adverse vascular events in patients with heart failure. So it's a, a trial where we look at adults with, with a clinical definition of heart failure based on New York Heart Association classification. And we exclude those with contraindications to the flu shot uh, we exclude those who are generally usually getting flu vaccines, and we ex exclude those who uh, are candidates for some surgical or valvular repair where the risk of um, heart failure might, might change. And we allow them actually outside of the trial if they want to get the flu vaccine, it's fine. They get randomized to either uh, Vaxigrip or, uh, or sterile saline as a control, and the primary outcome is a composite of cardiovascular death uh, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, hospital, and hospitalization for heart failure. So you can see this obviously has some sort of pragmatic uh, elements, but it's it's a trial which is you know totally designed. It's not real world uh, data because it's it has case record forms and and it's not based on any uh, sort of uh, administrative databases. And you know we're doing this trial and different countries in, in, in Africa, in the Middle East, uh, in uh, Philippines as well, in Southeast Asia, China, uh, and India. Uh, now there was a previous study that was uh, looked at high dose versus standard dose quadrivalent, which had to be stopped for fertility. This was published in, uh, in December. Again, this is another example of just a, you know, a randomized controlled trial, which is, you know, pragmatic, but not real world, uh, not real world data or real world evidence. Um, in contrast to that, uh, Sanofi is doing a pragmatic randomized controlled trial and it's pragmatic because, you know, they started off with a very, they're using a very, very large population of over 20,000 participants or over the age of 65, randomizing them to either high dose quadrivalent vaccine or standard dose uh, and then after that, they're getting all their outcome data from registries, from real world data. So you can see that it's an example of something that's sort of a hybrid design, that there's randomization, yet the outcome is pure real world data. So it's a, an example of a randomized controlled trial where real world evidence is being, uh, being generated. Uh, another example where, you know, it's not, it's along the route to real world, but not really as, as the studies we've been doing in, in Hutterite communities. These are small uh, colonies. Uh, Hutterites are Anabaptists that, uh, that live in these small colonies of 90 to 120 people in, uh, in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. And what we started doing, you know, we started maybe 15 years ago, is doing trials where, where the children are vaccinated, uh, you know, with different different vaccines and our first trial was a, done at a time where there was no, um, there was really no policy for vaccinating um, healthy children. So we vaccinate, so we vaccinated healthy children either to, in, in, in these colonies to either the flu vaccine or hepatitis A vaccine as a control. So the randomization was a cluster randomized controlled trial, which again is towards sort of real world evidence. But I guess because it's not, you know, we weren't using administrative data, we were collecting everything. It's not really, um, but it's, it's very pragmatic. And we compare those, you know, the, the two colonies where either the children get vaccinated uh, with flu vaccine versus colonies where they get the hepatitis A vaccine, which is the control. And the thing about this study is the primary outcome was not in the children, but it was in everybody else in the colony because most of those individuals were not getting vaccinated. The uptake was only 10%. So it was a way of looking at herd immunity or herd uh, effect. And again, what we found here was the effect, the, herd, the effect of vaccinated children was about 60% effective. So you know, almost well, as high as, as meta-analysis data, uh, uh, as high as actually direct effect. Um, and we've been, you know, doing similar studies in this in this population, comparing, you know, different types of, uh, of uh, vaccines. Um, so, uh, you know, one example again is is one can look at long-term care facilities, for example, and randomize 
you know, one facility to, to vaccine A versus B, and then look at hospitalizations and deaths from using administrative data. So this would be another example. It would be like, sort of, it could be done at a cluster randomized control trial level, like we were doing with the uh, with our HUD-RIDE studies. But again, this would definitely be real world evidence because the data is from administrators, uh, an administrative source. And, you know, there are different type of, types of schematas for randomized controlled trial uh, designs, which, you know, which might or might not be real world. I would say that the step wedge cluster randomized controlled trial is the closest because you do that where, you know, you randomize your, you're randomizing, but you're only randomizing one unit at a time. And that's often because it's, it's predicated on, on policy and on resources and you can't do it all at, all at once. So, it's, it's, you know, close to real world data. So when we're thinking of just gonna move away from uh, randomized controlled trials, just to observational uh, studies and real world evidence, what are the type of observational studies that can be used to estimate vaccine efficacy? And this is the sort of the list that's, you know, the traditional case control study cohort and two ones which are, you know, a bit, you know, they're, they're actually pretty specific for, uh, for vaccines, often flu vaccines, or in the case of indirect cohort, pneumococcal vaccines. And I'll just, you know, go through that, you know, very quickly, because I'm sure you're, you're familiar with the case control study. So a case control study is when you start with the, uh, with the outcome, you say, okay, you look at individuals who got the infection, whether it's the flu infection, and then you randomly select, or you know, usually it's randomly is usually better, select those that did not get the, uh, the, um, the infection. And then you look at the number in both groups with proportion that were exposed to vaccines. So that's a traditional case control study. Uh, or you could do a cohort study, which is more rigorous. Again, it's more like a randomized controlled trial, yet you're not randomizing them here you start with the exposure, right? So you start with a vaccine, where did they receive the vaccine or not? You follow them forward in time, and then you look at, you know, did they get uh, an infection or not? So those are, you know, very traditional um, designs used in, in a broad number of fields that could be used in, in influenza, you know, vaccinology as well. So the odds ratio, typically is used for case control studies and the relative risk is used to estimate risk for, uh, for cohort studies. Uh, and then, you know, more for a cohort study, there's time to event analysis. So when individuals are getting censored, they're coming in and out of the study, you'll, you can uh, compare two ratios, which, which is really the hazard ratio. The hazard is is really what's the probability someone survived to this point, what's the probability they're gonna have an event over the next period of time. So uh, in the way vaccine efficacy is um, summarized is either one minus the relative risk, one minus the odds ratio, or one minus the hazard ratio times 100, and that's either observational or randomized controlled trial data. Um, now, when you look at you know, evidence-based medicine. And when you look at what, you know, regulatory authorities, I mean, they tend to look at individual studies if we, you know, just not talk about the systematic reviews and summaries, but individual studies that randomized controlled trials are always, you know, sort of at the top. And I don't think there's any changing that. You can't really change that because, you know, because there's design elements there that make it, you know, make them the most rigorous. Um, then there's the cohort, the observational studies uh, fall under that. And when you look at uh, the approaches to using grade methodology, uh, if you look at you know, step number one, you look at the, the initial design and it starts off. Now, I'm not saying that all randomized controlled trials are, you know, uh, are the greatest, but they get more brownie points uh, a priori. So you get higher confidence in a randomized control trial, lower confidence in an observational study, and then you see what the data are showing and then how the study was conducted. So if there's a risk of bias, it's lower, there's inconsistency. Let's say if you're summarizing, pooling the data, there's inconsistency in the effect size. If there's indirectness, for example, 
you know, the, the vaccine study is not about COVID, but it's about seasonal coronavirus, then it loses brownie points. If the confidence of integrals are very wide, it's imprecise. If, the, if you're looking at a, reviewing a systematic review and there's obvious publication bias, well, then it detracts. Uh, there is higher, um, you know, it raises the confidence, again, whether it's an RCT or an observational study, if there's a large effect, if there's a dose response, if all plausible confounding uh, and bias is removed, and that becomes a lot easier to do when you've randomized participants than using you know, observational data. And that's just the fact. I don't think that that uh, is something that can change readily. And at the end, you say, you know, what's your level of confidence in this data? Is it high, moderate, or low? And then at the very bottom, this is the quality of evidence. You look at balance between benefits, harms, resources, and patient values. To you know, to ultimately, you know, make a decision about uh, whether you want to uh, inform policy or not. So this is a way of of you know of, of framing things, and you can see that that both RCTs and uh, and real world data can and evidence can fall into this uh, this framework. So can RCTs be biased? Uh, of course. Uh, I mean, again, this is not necessarily a bias. This is an example of you know, why you want to enroll high-risk patients. Um, it's just that you can, you know, if you have, uh, if you look at these panels and if you're looking at all eligible participants and here the, you know, the, the, the important thing is to, to look at the control event rate. And you can see that in the first panel, the control event rate is not that high, 0 0.5. And, um, you know, you were, the, the trial was not able to demonstrate a significant difference between the two groups. But if the control event rate was 0 0.8, so those people, let's say in the placebo arm of the vaccine study were more likely to get the flu, for example, even if you fix the ability of the vaccine to reduce the risk, you'll be able to see a difference. So and if you just you know, go with low risk patients, it's even, it's even worse. So uh, you could also, uh, if you selectively enroll highly responsive patients, you're more likely to get a, uh, an outcome. So the the you know the, the the converse is if you're not doing that, you might your your trial might fail to see a difference. So here the control event rate is fixed, uh, but it's the relative risk reduction that if it's only a 25 percent, you're not going to show an effect. But if you're if the effect is you know 40 percent, then you can more easily show it. And and finally, and this is a bias. This is effective incomplete ascertainment. So this is what happens in, uh, you know, in if you're you know, doing a trial and you're ascertaining all events, so you've got all the flu infections, you see you're able to see a difference, but this panel just shows you that if you're, you miss, start to miss 25% of the events in each group, um, if you're out of luck, um, you know, you can't really fix that. And uh, your, your trial shows that no difference between the two groups. So just to, examples to show that, that randomized controlled trials can have issues. And uh, you know, just because they're randomized doesn't mean that everything is fine. Now, a number of years ago, this is from a study in the New England Journal where the authors, they were trying to make the point that, well, you know, if you look at certain conditions like a certain interventions like lab, uh, uh, coles, I think this was laparoscopy, uh, coles that uh, the observational studies and the randomized control trials showed the same uh, effect, you know, and uh, that's really, you know, gone out the window. No, no one really believes that, that, uh, you know, that, that it's all the same and that you could always do observational studies and it's the same as randomized control trials. I think you know, I think you have to, to understand the strengths and limitation of each type of, of design. And, you know, and to make that point, this is really important in the uh, influenza vaccine world, because there were a number of studies that, you know, um, showed these huge risk reductions. These studies were done over, I don't know, the 1990s, mainly using administrative databases. And, you'd see, you know, oh, the flu vaccine is associated with a 40% risk of, you know, 40% risk reduction for death, for cardiac cause, for stroke, you name it. It's just, wow, this is so great. Uh, but some people started questioning this, and this is, uh, 
uh, Mona Simonson, who's sort of asking, uh, who's an epidemiologist in, in the US, who's sort of saying, hey, if you look at vaccine coverage from 1980 to 2001, it, it's increased. Um, if you, you know, assume that a, the vaccine was 60 or 70% effective at reducing death, and this is what was being reported, you'd expect the, uh, you know, you'd expect the uh, mortality rate to be reduced, but in fact, the mortality rate increased and age adjusted, it was just flat. So that was saying, you know, maybe these effect sizes from these observational studies of influenza vaccine are too good to be true. And in fact, that's really the case. And it was demonstrated first by Lisa Jackson, who said, okay, let's, let's compare uh, individuals with all-cause death, or let's say, uh, you know, mortality, and those who had influenza, uh, pneumonia, or, or influenza hospitalization. Let's look at, at cases. Those would be cases. Controls did not have those. And look at, let's look at the proportions who were vaccinated with the flu. And they found that the thing that Lisa did that was a little interesting is that she did it, this analysis before flu was circulating and all of a sudden found, oh, look, individuals, the flu vaccine is associated with a de decreased risk of death, decreased risk of pneumonia, influenza, hospitalization, and flu is not even circulating. So it was obviously you know, a healthy person bias that was going on. So this is, again, one of the dangers of observational uh, studies. Now, one way around some of this is the test, test negative design, which isn't perfect, but that's really become you know, a very predominant way of looking at uh, you know, observational studies for flu vaccines. So when you look at individuals who have flu-like illness, for example, they go to the clinic and if they, they get tested and if they got if they're positive for the flu, they become a case. If they're negative, they become a control. And you basically look at the proportion of who are vaccinated in each group. So that tends to be less, uh, less biased. The other is an indirect cohort design, mainly for pneumococcal vaccines, where you're comparing, you know, the control is pneumococcal disease that's not serospecific, that's not non-vaccine serotypes versus vaccine serotypes. So the, the test negative design indirect cohort, of, you know, sort of, similar sort of studies. And there've been a number of studies looking at vaccine uh, effectiveness using the test negative design, which has shown estimates overall, you know, if you pool them about 60% or so, which is pretty good because if you look at the randomized controlled trial data, it's, uh, you know, from this analysis, and this is not the more recent RCTs, but showing a sort of similar effect. So there are still problems with test negative design. There's data that suggests that, you know, uh, if the vaccine status varies over the study, there, there could be bias. So, you know, it's not, uh, it's, it's good. It's better than other observational studies uh, or study designs, but it's still not perfect. Um, and, you know, what, in, in, if you look in the literature, uh, the best approach that's, that's used right now for applying real world evidence to vaccine efficacy, is sort of to treat it like a randomized controlled trial. So set your eligibility criteria, specify your vaccines, try to make sure that you know, the, the, the assignment you, you know, is, is correct, or specify the follow-up, do this APRI, follow the outcome and the analysis plan. So try to emulate randomization when you're looking at intervention, adjust for confounding factors, uh, use maybe propensity scores, match, or something like that. Again, it, it never gets, it approaches randomization. It might approach randomization, but it's not the same. Uh, and then adjust for confounders. You can match on a number of things, on demographics, ethnicity, pregnancy, you know, past flu vaccine, all of those types of things that can be matched on. And you could check on healthy bias. Was there an effect in the first 14 days? So traditionally in flu studies, the, you know, the flu vaccine only has an effect after 14 days or its maximum effect after 14 days because that's the time it takes to generate the maximum antibody. So if you're seeing a great effect in your database within 14 days, you, you, know, you, have, to, you have to be very cautious. Um, these are, uh, this is just a table of recommended dosages and routes of administration for flu vaccines recommended for the 2021 20. Uh, 2022 flu season, and, and uh, you know, I show this just to 
to show that that for you know many of these studies uh, there were inactivated trials uh, you know from uh, RCTs high dose uh, versus standard dose vaccine in an RCT adjuvanted vaccine like more immunogenicity uh, studies and some observational studies for adjuvanted and for cell based uh, you know there have been uh, some uh, observational studies for LIV. The, the pivotal studies were randomized controlled trials. Um, so this is a, you know, a study uh, that was sponsored by, uh, by Securis comparing various types of vaccines, adjuvanted, uh, trivalent, high-dose, uh, egg-based uh, vaccines, and basically looking at the types of steps that uh, one would use uh, in using you know, real-world evidence. So, Basically, uh, defining the population, linking, um, looking at you know subject available activity, and uh, and really then looking at uh, various databases that allow one to ascertain uh, the outcomes, whether it's flu-like hospitalization or whatever the outcome uh, is, and and you know these are the sort of the effect sizes. This is an example of adjuvanted trivalent versus a trivalent high dose, similar except with a uh, better effect for flu-like related office visits would be with the adjuvant. Um, this is a, just a, again, a, an example of cell-based quadrivalent versus, uh, versus egg-based standard. The, the, the cell base you know, gets rid of the effect of uh, egg adaptation. So particularly for H3, uh, it would sort of get rid of a lot of those problems. And there's, again, this is the observational data suggesting uh, benefits for certain outcomes. Um, and just to, uh, to, to wrap up here, this is, again, the era of uh, SARS-CoV-2. So uh, I'm not going to go into this in more remote detail, but you know there's, there's well, various different platforms for um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, vaccines for COVID-19, including uh, mRNA, mRNA vaccines. And to, um, you know, when something really new comes about or really serious infection like COVID, you know, I'd say still randomized controlled trials provide the, the, the most important data. And this is what we've seen with the mRNA vaccines by Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, but as they get rolled out, I mean, those, those the populations were very selective. And uh, again, it was, it was meant to look at populations where the vaccine would have an effect. So one needs to have real world data that, that's, I'd say, complementary because then you're looking at um, different types of populations and using test negative designs, figure out what the vaccine efficacy is. And also uh, these types of designs are important because you could follow things uh, through through variants, so I think it's it's they they both sort of studies designs complement each other. So to summarize, then I think um, you know uh, real world evidence has traditionally been used for safety signals. Increasingly, it's been used for vaccine efficacy. Uh, there's various designs that are used uh, for for flu. Test negatives are the most uh, common, and I think that real world evidence can play an important role with new platforms and rapidly changing epidemiology. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Fantastic. I don't know. It's heavy stuff, um, but very, very important. And it's uh, it's also very important in our our world. And we're going to see a lot more of that um, as as time goes on. Sometimes the real world evidence you don't want them to use real world evidence. Um, we do have a question from the audience. Um, we. And I'm not sure if you can answer this or not, but can you give the flu vaccine and the COVID vaccine together? Well, that's a good question. Because <laughs> the real answer is probably we don't know, but in uh, at this stage, okay, at this stage, uh, NASI recommends, the, the Canadian recommendation is for, if you give the COVID vaccine first, you have to wait 28 days to give the flu vaccine. If you give the flu vaccine first, you have to wait 14 days before giving COVID. Now, they have not 
uh, you know, I, I, I think they push this away in the United States <laughs> to, to, and I think they're co-administering. So uh, the bottom line is this was done, this uh, recommendation was done on a precautionary principle uh, and I would suspect that it's going to change. I would suspect that, um, you know, that, that it's going to be reviewed uh, this fall. I, I can't be sure of that, but I suspect it would be, and I, I suspect there would be new recommendations. The, the concern was, you know, if you get COVID and there's a cytokine sort of storm, you know, not cytokine storm, but, you know, you're giving, you're, you're having a, an inflammatory response. If you give another vaccine, can you, would it lead to more reactogenicity, you know? So, uh, I think it's, I, I don't think, and there haven't been, you know, the, the randomized controlled trial would be to randomize individuals to co-administration or to, you know, that sort of 28-day uh, difference and look at immunogenicity and reactogenicity, but I'm not aware that that trial is being done. So that's, that's my best answer. Um, I think I would, I think the audience would be interested in your comments about uh, third doses. Is it a third dose? Is it a booster dose? Right, um, right. So that's a, yeah. yeah. So that's an interesting thing because <laughs> I've got a vested interest in the in the third dose because we have we put together I don't know over the last few weeks actually a protocol that's been approved for Health Canada to to randomize residents of long term care facilities to either a third uh, dose of, a, of Moderna, given that, that they had a primary series of either Moderna or Pfizer and used a PC, a PBC-13 and pneumococcal conjugate vaccine as a comparator and look at neutralizing um, antibody because uh, our data and whatever's published suggests you know, anywhere from 20 to 40% of individuals um, in long-term care after their first two do doses of, a, of an mRNA vaccine don't have uh, neutralizing antibodies. It's not detectable, right? So, so there's the concept of booster or additional dose. So the, the, you know, I guess our study would be sort of a combination of both because if, if there's been a, if, if it's been a long time since your second dose, it's a booster. If, if you're doing it as a primary series, then it's a, then it's a, an additional dose. And, and, um, uh, Again, to my knowledge, there's 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 just not uh, data out there, uh, at least that's in the public realm right now on on that. Certainly not randomized, um, and yeah, so that so that's it. So, um, I, I well, I would I, I preface that by saying that because I've just been referring mainly to the long term care. There is there is one population where there is that, and that's in the immuno immunocompromised, right? So so there's that trial, you know. Of, uh, I think 150 people or so in, uh, from Toronto that were randomized, and at least there's that one trial. If, if I might be mistaken if there's not, if there's another one, but um, there is data. So I think there's the most solid data there. There's there's good you know randomized controlled trial data that uh, that randomizing those individuals to a third dose of an mRNA vaccine actually improves the uh, their ability to respond to neutralizing antibodies. Um, now. You know, in terms of uh, you know, in terms of general policy, again, you've got different uh, you know different things to weigh. You have the you know the vulnerability of the population. Um, you have the time uh, since the last that dose, right? How long? How how much waning has occurred? Uh, you have the issue of well, how responsive would it be? You have the issue of are, what outcome are you looking when you're talking about this? Are you, Talking about immunogenicity or or actual vaccine efficacy, what uh, you know, what data are you looking for? Uh, what subpopulations are you looking for? So there's just a, a number, you know, a number of issues, and then of course the the issue, the, the global issue about uh, you know some countries giving everybody a third dose when you have other countries that which have no none. You know, so there's uh, there, there are a lot of there are a lot of issues around this. Um, we have a, a question. What are your thoughts on the latest ISIS test negative design study from the British Medical Journal on the effectiveness of the mRNA vaccines in light of your appreciation for this kind of design? 
if I recall, um, I you know I, have, I saw it I saw it just very very briefly, but the that that BMJ data I believe just I, I might be I'd have to bring it um, bring it up, but but it the you know the efficacy was you know was sort of reduced uh, because I believe that that included the Delta variant and uh, at least. For SARS-CoV-2, I believe the efficacy was uh, was reduced somewhat, uh, as I as I recall. Um, but I, I again, I, I think that's the sort of data where you know you're not going to have time to do a, you know a randomized controlled trial, and you have the randomized controlled trial data, but it makes sense to use this sort of test negative design to see what's happening, um, sort of you know in the real world. After the you know after the individuals uh, you know have been have been vaccinated, so I, I think it's a it's a you know I have no issues with that design, and I think that that is a, an appropriate uh, application. If that answers the question, I I, I forget like I, I I can't I can't recall the actual estimates, but um, it, that was that, that would be my response. Certainly. Um, I think someone's gone back to the third dose, and I don't even know if you can answer this. I don't think we have the data yet. Um, so for a, a healthy person, how many days do you think we need to suggest as for the third dose after this to wait after the second dose? Well, you know, uh, I mean, most most of the, you know, if you look at, uh, for, well, first of all, we don't we don't actually have all of that data. So there are uh, to the best of my knowledge, there's a, there are trials, you know, randomized controlled trials that are answering that. So I'm not gonna, I won't go out on a limb and say, you know, it's it's this period, this time frame. Uh, but based on on data, you know, that's available, you know, delaying is not, you know, if you look at the totality of vaccine studies, right? When you look at, at a a delay in vaccines, it's it actually it's not a Detriment. It's actually a benefit <laughs> in in that you know you if you look at the, there's been a systematic review that looked at all sorts of vaccines and actually three months was actually a good time it was a good delay because it found better better effect with better memory um, response after you know after a good chunk of, of time but of course you know uh, it it really depends on you know the, the whole reason why the mRNA vaccines used a you know relatively limited period of time was you know to try to offer protection to people when they were at highest risk. So there's there's always that trade-off in terms of you know if you're in a, a very high risk situation and um, there's a trade-off between waiting when it's safe to wait you're, you're often better off waiting but if it's not safe sometimes you have to get it a little bit sooner. Is this, if anything, COVID taught us is a lot of balancing of risk and benefit uh, over this past uh, year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, how long do you wait to get more information before you realize that your risk is too high? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, just. Oh, there's a there's a question of why vaccine grip was was picked. Oh, the, the the reason vaccine grip was used was because we were doing the study internationally, right? And it it was the only influenza, and, and it, at the time and still now, if you look at all these countries, it's one of the only vaccine that's vaccines that that's licensed in those countries. So there there was no way we were going to be able to do a five thousand person trial in you know 10 countries in Africa and, and start trying to get you know the, the regular the regulatory approval for different vaccines it would have just been totally impossible. Well that's it for the questions. I appreciate your um, uh, talk this evening and uh, we'll be sending out for all the all the participants will be sending out uh, a recording and you will also get um, the slides so you can have a reference for yourself and I appreciate everybody coming. We appreciate Dr. Loeb for your, um, your this information and an excellent uh, um, uh, develop, professional development um, session. So thanks very much everybody and have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.